Welcome to a comprehensive exploration of the fascinating world of frame mines engineering. If you're a fresh graduate engineer or someone delving into the intricacies of this field, you've definitely come to the right place. The quality of the results of a structural analysis depends on how closely the structural model matches reality. Indeed, the idealization of reality into a structural model is not just an academic exercise, it's a vital engineering task. All structural models are discretized into one or more structural members, with a variety available for this purpose. Among them, longitudinal members such as truss bars, beams, and column elements are most popular in hand calculations. They're called longitudinal because they are significantly longer in one direction compared with the other team. In this video, we will help you understand how to model beams, define end conditions, and master the degrees of freedom involved. So grab a notebook and let's dive into the idealization of structures, a critical step in transforming our built environment. Whether you're an aspiring engineer or a curious mind, you're sure to find value in what lies ahead. We will start by introducing the three most used forms of idealized end conditions of a member. On the top, we have the roller support, which allows the member to move right and left horizontally, but stops any vertical movement and thus has a vertical reaction force. On the bottom most, we have the pin support. The pin support resists translation or linear movements along both X and Y axis. If it's in the two-dimensional problem, as shown below, and unlike a fixed support, which also resists moments, the pin support allows the structural member to rotate. Thus, no moment is transferred through the pin support. Pin support generates internal reaction forces, but not moments, in two dimensions, this would typically be a vertical and horizontal directional force. The pin support is an idealization. In real life application, there may be some slight resistance to rotation due to friction or deformation. And lastly, in the middle, we have the fixed support. The fixed support provides a resistance against translation in all directions. And unlike pin or roller supports, which allow rotation, a fixed support also resists rotation around all axes. This means that it has the ability to carry moment in addition to axial and shear forces. Fixed supports generate internal reaction forces and moments. These typically include reactions along the X, Y, and Z axis, as well as moments around the axis. It's important to know that a perfect fixed support is an idealization. Real world, fixed supports may exhibit some degree of flexibility and may not fully restrain all degrees of freedom due to factors like material deformation, slippage, or foundation settlement. Here are some real-world examples of roller supports. On the left, we can see concrete roller supports that have been implemented under a pre-stressed concrete bridge. And on the right, you've got a metal roller support that's part of a bridge girder. Now, I want you to pay close attention because what you see in real life doesn't perfectly align with the theoretical models you might have studied. In theory, roller supports are supposed to allow free movement in the horizontal direction while resisting vertical forces. But guess what? In these actual examples, you'll notice there's a bit of horizontal resistance too. That's right. These supports aren't sliding around as freely as you'd expect. Why? Well, there are factors like friction and perhaps even some minor deformations that induce horizontal forces. Now, right up here on the top of the screen, take a look at this double angle connection between a beam and a column. Notice something? Neither the angles nor the beam are welded to the column. What does that mean? Well, means this connection allows for some degree of rotation. Engineers often model this type of setup as a pin support, which as you may know, permits rotation but resists translational movement. Hold on a second. Before you rush to your textbooks, 
there's usually some bending resistance happening at this kind of support. Yet, for most analysis, we tend to neglect the bending resistance to simplify the calculations. Now let's shift our gaze to the bottom of the screen. Here we have another double angle connection with a twist. The beam stop flange is welded directly to the column. There is also an angle seat welded to the bottom of the beam and the column. This design locks things up pretty tightly. Because of these welds, the beam can rotate around the joint. In engineering lingo, this kind of condition is typically idealized as a fixed support, meaning it restrains both translational and rotational movements. So there you have it folks, two similar looking connections but with fundamentally different behaviors when it comes to movement and rotation. Always remember the devil is in the details and understanding these nuances is crucial in the field of civil engineering. Let's shift gears and focus on this fantastic example of truss structure commonly used in foot crossing bridges over highways. The truss is composed of two parallel trusses connected by wooden planks, transverse beams and stringers. All four ends of the truss are bolted down to the floor. However, Let's talk about how engineers like to simplify things when analyzing such a structure. Typically, we only consider one of the two trusses during our calculations. Why? Well, for one, the symmetry of this truss. The weight of the wooden planks, transverse beams, and stringers is usually accounted for as point loads at the joints of that single truss and these weights or loads are divided equally between both trusses on either side. Now here is where it gets a bit more nuanced. In the real world, the ends of the truss are bolted down, making them essentially fixed. For the sake of analysis, we usually model one end as a pin support and the other as a roller support. You might wonder why the discrepancy. The answer is simple. It's all about making the structure statically determinate. This enables us to perform hand calculations more efficiently using methods like the joint method to find the internal forces within the truss members. Here we have one final example to sum up everything we've learned so far. What we're looking at might initially seem like a complex three-dimensional problem, but guess what? With a little bit of engineering magic, we can simplify this into a much more manageable two-dimensional problem. The beauty of engineering, making complex things simpler to understand and solve. First, let's zoom into joint A, where the column meets the ground. Now notice those angles and triangular stiffeners. These components prevent the column from rotating and moving in any direction, because they're anchored securely to the ground. So in engineering terms, this is what we'd call a fixed support. There is both translational and rotational movements. Now let's swing over to point B where the column and the beam come together. Pay close attention to this connection. The way it's designed prevents the beam from rotating relative to the column. Additionally, they're bolted together, which means neither can move horizontally nor vertically. So similar to joint A, we idealize this as another stitch. But what about the load, donated as F, hanging from a hook that runs on rails along the beam's bottom flange? Well, for analysis purposes, we can simplify this as a single point load acting downwards on the beam at specific from the column. Namely, in this drawing, we can see is 3 meters. Thank you. Tell me in the comments what would you like to see next.